There you go. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, this is another one of our series on the highly successful program called Leadership Seminars. And we are delighted to have with us a rising star in <laughs> the United States Army. And I mean that, I mean that sincerely. And perhaps, you know, she generates, uh, she'll be making star rank here uh, in a few years. But we have Dr. Lieutenant Colonel Dr. Uh, Hyo Jin, will be call her Gina Cho. Uh, she's a Korean American, immigrated to the United States when she was 11 years old. And later in her life, she found the calling to enlist in the Army National Guard in the District of Columbia, Army National Guard in 1998, and was later commissioned as a transportation officer. Uh, she has spent almost 20 years in the military, uh, the Army, um, if I get that correctly, and has continued her most recent assignment was as a battalion commander of the 1225th Combat System and Support Battalion and multi component battalion uh, out of Michigan in support of uh, Atlantic, Atlantic Resolve in uh, European Command. I think that was in Poland, right? That it, yes, was, sir. Was in yes, Poland. sir. So, you know, uh, she was not, uh, her unit was not to be tied up at home station, but they decided that to, to support in, in a deployment. And she's currently serving as a national security fellow at Harvard University, which is a senior service college equivalent. Uh, in Boston, Massachusetts, which is uh, one of the few fellowship uh, assignments that, that uh, outstanding officers in, in all of the services can attend. Uh, just had a very uh, a lengthy assignment in her staff time. Uh, supply branch chief, uh, assistant executive officer at the National Guard Bureau, uh, and most notably as the aide de camp to the chief of the National Guard Bureau. Uh, before her selection to battalion command. Uh, she's also served in battalion and, and brigade assignments uh, and uh, also deployed to her first and second deployments were to uh, the operation of Iraqi freedom as a platoon leader, I think as an, an MP unit in 2005, 2006 and later as a company commander in 2009 and 2010. Uh, not to be tied down anywhere, but she's highly educated. Uh, graduated from the University of Maryland uh, with a degree in Spanish language and literature, which is just multilingual now. Uh, a master's in a national security management from Webster University and later as master of arts in military studies, on military studies from the uh, Marine Corps University, where she also attended um, as a resident student at the Marine Corps University as part of a command and staff uh, college equivalent. Uh, she has a doctorate in organizational leadership from the University of Phoenix in 2011 with her dissertation. And I want to read this slowly because you know it's, it's a long title on unspoken leadership development tool, a phenomenological, <laughs> I'm tongue tied there, but I think you get it study on cross-race mentoring in the United States Army. And by the way, that was uh, welcomed uh, and was utilized by the Department of Army in their diversity uh, and inclusion uh, program uh, and uh, uh, way back when, around 2010, I believe, or, yeah, uh, after 2011 when she did that dissertation. And she also authored Mentoring and Diversity for the Armed Forces Controller magazine. So she's a noted writer. Uh, awards and uh, military awards, the Bronze Star Medal, of course, Defense Military Service Medal, uh, and other awards. She received the 28th Federal Asian Pacific American Council Payback Military Meritorious Service Award, uh, the Brigadier General William E. Horton Award for the Most Outstanding Commander of the Year and the Major General Charles Southward Leadership Award from the DC National Guard. Uh, I've asked, uh, because of all these progressive assignments and recognition that she has attained over the period of her time in, uh, on both guard and active duty, I asked Dr. Cho to somewhat craft or put together um, her leadership philosophy. That is tantamount to say similar to what we have 
in the past. Uh, coincidentally, we don't teach leadership philosophy that I know of. Uh, whether attended uh, uh, the advanced course or command and leadership or command and staff college at the Naval uh, uh, Navy, uh, I'm sorry, command and staff college at Rhode Island or at the Army War College. It's one of those things that is a kind of like, a, you might say, uh, I got to develop one. And, and I think it's important that when, when leaders like Lieutenant Colonel Cho in any service should at least have developed a leadership philosophy that was mentored on them, but that's not always the case. So I asked her to at least share in, in, in her progressive assignments and also leadership development, what constitutes developing a leadership philosophy. So without further ado, let's give a virtual program to Lieutenant Colonel slash Dr. Gina Cho. Thank you, General Tuguva, for that great introduction. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Thank you for having me. When General Tuguba spoke to me about this topic, I thought it was very timely, as, as he just mentioned. I just came out of command, and last two years of the, the, the command assignment had to be my toughest assignment and most challenging assignment. So as I came out of command, I was doing a lot of reflecting, um, especially on my command philosophy. However, my journey in writing my current leadership philosophy began back in about 2005, 2006, when I was a platoon leader uh, in Iraq. I am a transportation officer. So at that time, I did uh, go on a lot of convoys with my soldiers. And to be perfectly frank, that was probably the first time Time, I really thought about death. And what it did for me, um, which I believe is really a blessing, what it did for me is it forced me to think about many questions. And one of the questions that I asked myself was, how do I want to be remembered? And that question, uh, the response to that question, it was, it was an immediate uh, answer to uh, answer. And that was uh, to be a good person and be a good leader. And that in turn became my foundation to my, uh, my current leadership philosophy. This is our agenda. Uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna go over some basic information and I'm gonna share with you uh, the process that I went through in developing my current leadership philosophy. And I'm gonna do, I'm gonna uh, share with you some of my reflection, um, AAR if you will, on my, uh, what, what happened uh, past two years um, and how I enforced it and what worked and what didn't work. And I'm going to share some recommendations. And of course, uh, I can't not uh, conduct this brief without talking about mentoring relationship and how that affects mentoring relationship. I mean, we are here um, as a part of PPOM. And at the end of the brief, I hope to hear from the audience, uh, maybe perhaps your leadership philosophy, the process that you went through and just to have a good discussion about this topic. Not to insult anyone's intelligence, but in order to have a common definition of leadership philosophy, I am sharing with you one of the uh, definitions that I read in um, one of the articles. It is set of beliefs, values, and principles, and it influences our behavior in reaction to others. What is not though, uh, it is not leader's vision for the organization. And although that is important, that leans a little bit more towards command philosophy versus leadership philosophy. And certainly leadership philosophy is not a summary of past positions and accomplishments. So why do we need to have command uh, leadership philosophy? I'm sorry. Uh, it is not a requirement as General Taguba just uh, alluded to. We don't really talk about it often. You hear about it maybe from some leaders, but it's not something we are taught in our schools, not often anyway. But the, the main reason to have uh, leadership philosophy is to manage expectations. What I mean by that? What I mean by that is um, it shares what we are expect, uh, what we can expect. Um, it, it gives, it is shared, it gives the, the people that we lead and the, the teams we lead what to expect from us. And they can also, um, uh, we're going to share what we expect from them, and then they they can uh, know what is expected from um, uh, from us. 
and it guides the uh, decision making process. So, for example, even when you're not in, in, let's just say you're away and you have someone that is second in charge, whether it's in a military organization or civilian education, uh, civilian organization, uh, that person understands your core values and beliefs so that he or she can take on uh, that leadership philosophy and then uh, make those decisions. And ultimately, I believe it sets the organizational culture. What I do want to emphasize here, though, the, although the audience, for the most part, may be the people that we lead or the teams that we lead, it, it really helps us, the leader. Uh, as you are, as we are writing down our core beliefs and values, trying to write our leadership philosophy, it helps us to narrow down uh, because if we were to have conversations about it, there will be many words for many of us that just come up. But when you start writing it down, it becomes a little bit more difficult. And when we do that, it, it gives us a better understanding of ourselves. And um, and I would just I would kind of share with you a little bit of story about the the last comment about how it helps us to guide our actions and attitudes, and in in turn it also keeps us uh, on track. And I, I will talk about later on as I um, discuss my leadership philosophy. So here, as I, I mentioned earlier, I wanted to uh, share my personal example and the process that I went through um, in writing my current leadership philosophy. So I wasn't sure if I wanted to share this or not because it is very personal. Uh, as you can see, you see two pictures here. One on the left was just some of the notes that I made while attending the Leadership uh, Academy form. Uh, this was August of 2019. I don't know what led me to write this down, but um, I just kind of started writing down some words and I would call it um, mind mapping. And I just kind of try to see, put the arrows around it and see what re is related to what. Uh, so I just kind of write it that down. And then the picture on the left, I mean, actually to the right, is the uh, somewhat like a leadership model that I was looking at. And again, I wrote down all the words that was important to me at that time as it relates to my leadership, my core values and beliefs. And um, the, this regard all the notes that are around it, uh, because that was when I was a branch chief, but I just needed something visual. Uh, visual. So I just kind of started scrib scribbling and I just took a picture of it. So that's even though I actually that the process began back in 2005, 2006, I didn't actually start writing it down until summer of 2019. And around that time, I had just pinned a lieutenant colonel or I was still a major, I don't exactly remember. But as a major up until that point, I was a staff action officer at the National Guard Bureau. So the words that continuously came up uh, as I sp spoke to other um, junior officers or NCOs or other um, civilians that I was leading were the uh, initiative, follow up, communicate and build relationships. Because I believe those were um, the reasons why I was be able to success be successful action officer. And those are, of course, actionable um, words. However, I was uh, looking forward and envisioning. At that time, I didn't know if I was selected as a battalion commander. I was going through the board. I wasn't sure where I was going to go. Uh, but I envisioned myself as a battalion commander. And I wanted to make sure I incorporate those uh, core values that I have uh, so the people that I lead and the organization I lead is very clear on my current um, philosophy. So what I did was uh, all the words that I, I thought of, I wrote it down and I kind of categorized those keywords under common themes. So as you can see here on the left side, that is my current command and leadership philosophy. So I, I mentioned that earlier that there is a slight difference between leadership philosophy and command philosophy. So I kind of combined the two together. So when I uh, drafted this, one of the biggest uh, things that I thought about is that I want it to be something very simple. So I'm sure many of you can uh, test to this, but we have quite a few documents out there that uh, we take time to write, yet nobody reads them. Uh, I think SOP is probably one of them because usually it's very long. I've personally seen leadership philosophies or command philosophies that are really long. And you, you see it, but no, you know, the, the leaders or the commanders really don't talk about it. And then um, it seems like it's just something that nobody reads. So I want it to be something simple, one pager, easy to read, something that I can also uh, remember 
So I can, no matter where I go, my Sergeant Major, when we, Sergeant Major and I, when we are visiting soldiers, or regardless of the audience, I can just talk about it because it is something I can remember. And the audience, uh, I think it's important to note that the audience is for the soldiers in the battalion and specifically for the National Guard soldiers, because again, I was, um, I kind of envisioned that I was going to uh, command a National Guard unit and I didn't think much about the deployments or anything like that. And when I was writing this, I did a lot of research. I read quite a few leadership philosophies that are out there online. Uh, some of them were the battalion commander, uh, brigade commander level, and some of them were garrison level, and some of them were the uh, general officer, uh, flag officer level. And what I did is, just from reading all those different uh, leadership philosophies, I kind of used some of the words to uh, better, like, to help me better articulate some of the ways, things that I wanted to, I wanted to um, point out. And uh, perhaps some of these, uh, the themes may have come from that because like I said, why, why we invent the wheel, right? And one area, uh, so as you can see, I have character, accountability, personal professional development, resiliency and tenacity and self-care. So I have five different words or themes, I guess. Um, and one, one thing that is very uncommon is um, I use a movie quote. So uh, in Resilience and Tenacity, as you can kind of take a second to um, read, it's, it's a cool movie quote from one of the uh, Rocky movies. And that, that quote really stuck with me. And the reason why I use that quote is because um, resilience and tenacity is something is near and dear to my heart. Uh, I think that is a, a value that I've learned um, as, as, a, in, as a Korean American in Korean culture and definitely as an immigrant. And around that time frame, and even to this day, just to, to till this day, um, mental health is very critical. And we have a lot of young soldiers committing suicide. So I really wanted to um, get that message out there to those most junior young soldiers. So I took that uh, uh, uncommon approach so that when they do read it, they kind of be able to understand right away. It is not, it's, it's, it doesn't have a lot of army jargons or anything like that. So just something simple. And when I wrote this, I wrote it with an audience in mind. However, I knew that it would be something that would change over time. So my values necessarily may not change over time. However, depending on the organization that I go to, uh, perhaps promotion or increased responsibilities, uh, that will um, perhaps um, change this leadership philosophy just a, quite a bit, uh, depending on maybe maybe uh, instead of uh, character, I might want to uh, focus a little bit more on personal development and whatever the case might be. So I knew it would uh, be modified. That's why I took the time to write my first good, solid leadership philosophy so that from there, if I need to make changes, it wouldn't be too hard. Now that I've been out of command for a few months now, and I've been doing a lot of reflecting, I kind of asked myself, did it work? Uh, so what do I mean by that? So in, you know, we're in the environment where, how do we measure that? I think it is something that uh, it is hard to measure. However, just kind of looking at the result and result, I, I do believe um, there were some good in it and there were some areas that I could have worked uh, better on. So. Just to give you a background, so in the last two years, I commanded three different set of uh, units within the, so basically our headquarters was the same. However, when I took command, uh, the, uh, it was February 2020 and, and uh, COVID just hit. And so we were re reactivated for COVID and we were the first units to go through the, um, the, the, the National Training Center rotation. And so for that rotation, we had um, all Guard soldiers, National Guard soldiers from the seven different states and one active duty unit. So that was a totally different set of uh, units for, uh, for that specific mission. And then when we went overseas uh, to Poland, that was a multi-component uh, battalion consist of National Guard Reserve and um, the active duty units. And, and then when we returned, uh, we had the organic units that were originally for under 1225th uh, the combat sustainment support battalion. 
Why, why is that information important? Because within that two years and because of global pandemic, we did not have chance to have a face-to-face -face meeting prior to to NTC prior to deployment. And in even the organic units, I never got to meet them until we came back. And we had a, a set of mission for each phase of that two years. And we had to quickly uh, become cohesive team. And in order to do that, it was very important for me that um, I don't waver from that leadership philosophy. So again, how do, we, how do, how do I measure that? At, at the end, I, I, can, I can tell you that we had a visible teamwork. And that is hard to do when you have uh, a different set of people or that you've never worked with each other. Uh, but I do believe one of, the, one of the things that I did write is that I did not waver whatsoever uh, from my leadership philosophy, except for one, which I will talk about. Um, and, and because of that, I believe um, it worked well. Uh, we received numerous accolades from leadership, from internal and external leadership. And while we were deployed, uh, many of the battalions prior to us, and I know this because I had this conversation from my brigade commander, uh, Andy, uh, the, the leader sustainment command, commander, as well as the National Guard senior um, um, general officer there, uh, we had the least discipline, number of discipline actions and the uh, sexual uh, harassment assault related incidents. And that is, I believe, uh, due to not only um, my desire to just uh, really stick to my core values and my leadership philosophy. But of course, we had a great team that supported my uh, beliefs. And, and no matter how tough it got, I did not waver from that, especially when it came to accountability. So that's in my mind, that's, I, I, that's how we measure that, that leadership philosophy that, that I uh, share with my folks in each uh, phase of the two years. It uh, worked and something that I did right. However, uh, one area that I didn't do well is the um, self-care. So throughout my, uh, throughout my years in the military career, especially when I was younger, I thought self-care was something that in some ways it was selfish. Uh, but I've, I've learned quickly as I um, grew up in the military and had more increased responsibility, how important that is that we, the leaders, are we make the time in our calendar or whether in our personal time, time to think and time to rest so we can make appropriate decisions for our organization. However, with everything going on, um, I, I, as much as I believe in that, I was not taking care of myself well. And so I wasn't leading by example. And it was evident, it was a couple of incidents that happened uh, overseas, but it was evident to me that I was not taking care of myself, which affects, of course, the, the people that I lead in the organization. But what the leadership philosophy that I, I put it in writing, um, uh, how it worked and in how it benefited me in some ways, it really helped me to reflect and get back on track. So it's kind of it's kind of interesting because it is your own writing. It is your own, I don't want to say rules, but it is your own values. But because it is in writing, it is because it's something you enforce and you uh, share with your soldiers or the people that you lead. Uh, it's almost like, almost like I have to lead by example and go by that. So I, it helped me to realign myself with my core belief. For those of you that may not have leadership philosophy in writing just yet, uh, I'm sharing some questions to consider. Uh, this came from one of the articles that I read and I thought it was um, some good question to start. Uh, it, just like I talked about earlier, like how do you wanna be remembered? And what core values describe in God who you are as a leader? So again, these are just a recommendation. And I will tell you, when you start it, writing it down, it makes a huge difference versus just, just having it in your head. And know that it is a continuous mental practice. As uh, I think it's a Lieutenant Colonel uh, retired Garner stated in his um, article, Military Review, he stated that it's a process of constant self-evaluation and questioning. And I wanna emphasize that we're questioning of personal assumptions, beliefs, and values. And, and I think it is important to remember, it's not one and done, it's something that we have to continuously work on. As part of PPOM, our goal is um, to have that mentoring relationship. And so I can't not talk about mentoring relationship as I'm talking about this, uh, this topic here. So I made some recommendations and some notes here. 
So for mentors, um, if you do uh, have your leadership philosophy, if you haven't already, share your leadership philosophy with your mentees. And if you haven't developed one, I think it may be a good idea to develop one and share with them. And then I help the mentees to develop their own as well. What it does is it helps to understand each other, just like with the people that you lead, and it helps to develop connection or not. So often when I talk about mentoring relationship, I talk about the importance of chemistry. So you can be the, the best leader, the best uh, professional and highly motivated individual, but when you don't have that chemistry, I personally don't believe that mentoring relationship will last. So when you have your leadership philosophy and when you make that time to make uh, to write down the leadership philosophy and have that uh, conversation, it really helps to understand each other and it helps to develop that connection. And for mentors, uh, it's just a reminder that mentoring relationship is not just about the uh, career advice. It, 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 the mentors um, um, should help the mentees with their reflection and self-discovery process. And as one of the articles titles stated, uh, leadership begins with an inner journey. And for mentors, and I think we all can agree that mentoring relationship is not beneficial just for the mentee. It helps mentors just as much as the mentees it helps the mentors with their own self, uh, own mental practice and self-evaluation. And I uh, added to a quote here from Gandhi is that the best way to find yourself is to lose yourself in the service of others. So as a closing remark, uh, leadership is journey. We are all learners, whether we are leaders or not. But as we continuously, uh, um, as we, as we have, um, have increased the responsibilities, I think it's more important, uh, it's most important for us to continuously evaluate ourselves and learn ourselves so we can be a better service to others. So that uh, concludes my portion of the brief. So I welcome any thoughts, comments, and uh, leadership, uh, philosophy, lessons learned, if you will, uh, from the audience. Thank you. I, I hope everybody was listening. Uh, I got about a page full of notes that uh, what Dr. Cho, Gina, had, had articulated and some common and, um, and some things that are new, new to me. Uh, you always learn, like she said, leaders are also learners. Uh, and one of the things that, that uh, she had mentioned was, or at least alluded to, your leadership philosophy becomes somewhat your leadership style. And it's also a matter for you to be congruent over time. It's not one size fits all, but then those are the standards that you have in any organizations that you lead, that you're associated with other people. Um, and, and just kind of a personal war story. I, I took, when I was a captain, I was enamored by leadership. Uh, and I took a lot of notes on mental notes as well on leaders that I was associated with. Uh, to include leaders that I didn't want to be associated with uh, because they they didn't follow the rule. You know, your philosophy or what do you want to commit, what you want to uh, put in writing about how you want to succeed in that particular organization was not the same congruent to their uh, leadership style. They were either myopic about it uh, and then failed to follow their own rules or they actually went overboard and became a toxic leader. See, those are the kinds of things that you make a mental note or you write down and you say, okay, if, if I'm going to be successful, what are the good stuff that you wanna be and how are you going to apply that in your leadership style? And um, it's, it's not a hit and miss, it's a matter of following through. And your leadership philosophy literally, literally is your standard um, in life not just in leading an organization, but also your personal life. So, okay, some of you have got some searing questions to ask her. Uh, you know, it's, it's not a free lunch today, but maybe later when I see you graduate from, from Harvard University, <laughs> University <laughs> you know, and kind of, I spend some time there with, with the uh, Human Rights um, Council and the like, and, and also talking to the Harvard Law Center. Okay, 
All right, I'm gonna turn it over to the folks that's gonna ask those questions. It's never too late to ask any questions about leadership philosophy. It's either with you or not with you, so. Come on. Oh, okay, Otherwise, I'll go ahead, sir. Go ahead. So it was really a, a pleasure also talking to Dr. Cho, Gina. Um, I also learned a lot from her and appreciate the presentation, but I wanted to also add that um, using your leadership philosophy also can be part of your counseling program. So uh, we have a lot of leadership turnover. So we have a new like senior enlisted advisor for me. I have a new military department team. So um, tomorrow I'm having a sensing session also for both my civilian and military. And the presentation helped me out a lot. So I was taking a lot of notes, Gina, because um, I do uh, give them my leadership philosophy in slides, but I think it's important to also write it down, like you said, because like we give them snippets, you tell them you want them to uh, focus on teamwork, leadership, you know, being an HR professional and their values, but a part of your counseling can also be your leadership philosophy to them because it's, it's how they're guided and, and their expectations of, of, of you of them. So um, I, I do agree in the military, uh, we do a lot of slides, PowerPoint slides, and like we, we, we use a lot of that in our, um, just when you just do take command or take um, charge of your small team but I think you need to, to write it down because people uh, will do what you ask them to do if you give them guidance. Um, so that, that I just, I thought that was very helpful for me. It, it will also give me some time to rethink things because you could also use your leadership philosophy and it becomes canned and you have it throughout the years for many years, but you really have to relook it, like you said, and, and, it, and it changes as you become you know, a more seasoned leader. So as you were talking, I was also brushing up on some things because I can tell like, uh, you know, it has not been updated in some years and you can't keep giving the same canned advice. It, it does change in time. So I thought that was, that was really good. And lastly, uh, we just got a new HR deputy and I'm wondering if you know him. Um, his name is Mr. Jim Powell or James and he spent a lot of time in the NGB, so. Just curious if you knew him. <laughs> thank you, Gina. I don't, I don't, <laughs> thank you, ma'am, for that comment. I don't think I know him, but then again, I'm not, I, I, maybe I know him, I, maybe I've seen him before. <laughs> um, I did, I, thank you for that comment about the counseling. I, that's why I was kind of going back and looking at my slide. Uh, I did fail to mention, you're absolutely right, ma'am. It is something that um, I you do use, use in the various counseling sessions. Uh, at, as, and, and even with my um, initial counseling with my commanders and the people that I rate, as well as as a senior uh, rate, uh, as a senior rater, I use those bullets as the counseling, uh, I guess, talking points. And depending on who that person is or that uh, person's um, the rank, I might emphasize a little bit more on one area versus the other. So thank you for that comment. Appreciate it. Oh yes, thanks again, and thanks to General Tagu because right now a hot topic is command climate, also hostile work environment. So it's even more important for leaders to have the, their command and leadership philosophy because like we don't definitely, we want to make sure that they know that values, core values and moral and ethics and things like that are very important to us, not just on an evaluation, but you know, uh, daily in our, uh, in our work and in our leadership philosophy. So excellent comments. Thanks again. Thanks, ma'am. Anybody else? Questions? Come on, folks. Otherwise, we're going to stay on this Zoom for another hour. <laughs> <laughs> no punishment. I know James, you, and uh, and Armando probably have some questions there regarding where your previous assignments. And um, so ask away. Are you guys there? Yeah, so I guess I'll start here. So I guess my question would be, um, as I know you had briefly touched on it, you said that your, your, leadership, your leadership slash command philosophy began when you were a lieutenant. Uh, what, what, 
what made the the biggest impact for you in shaping your your leadership style if you will like what did you what were the key takeaways that you've learned through experience through institutional as well as well as academic uh courses um that you that you've experienced throughout your career in helping to shape your your philosophy and your command your leadership style thank you for that question so the if i understand you correctly there are various uh, events that took uh throughout my military career and in personal life but i can't it, it, i think my core the the foundation comes from um and, and it actually, this is something that I've reflected past a uh, few months because I, I just recently uh, did a podcast with uh, this um, this uh, person, and that w one of the questions kind of was just something similar. And as an immigrant, and I didn't because I never really thought about this, but as an immigrant and as as a Korean American, I didn't realize how uh, prevalent that that resiliency and tenacity um, was important in my life. So that I think that was one of the things like the character resiliency and um, tenacity came from uh, just being a Korean American and being an immigrant going through those challenging times with my parents and just really working hard. The accountability comes from being enlisted soldier. And I share this with uh, I have shared this with a lot of my enlisted soldiers is that when I was that young, well, I would say <laughs> I wasn't young. I started military when I was 23. So I guess relatively I was old, but um, as a, as a as a uh, as a specialist and even as a young sergeant, I saw many times when I felt like I was doing the right thing, and others would uh, come to training or come to uh, the events late or never volunteer for anything. But nothing would happen to that. They still get paid the same amount of money, and they still get promoted. And I promised myself then uh, that if I am ever in the position of uh, leadership or in a position of authority and I can influence that, I will make sure that I hold people accountable. And I've done that ever since um, I became an officer. And some of the uh, some of the, the, the values, as such as our personal and professional development, uh, that is something that uh, in self-care came from. Let me just stick to the professional and uh, personal leadership development. That that became such a big thing for me, and it's kind of strange. As, as I was going through the doctorate program, so it took me eight years to finish school because I had to deploy to Iraq as a um, platoon leader and as was a company commander, so I had to take a break. But during that time, I really learned uh, that. Um, as in some ways a cliche it is, like more you learn, how much you just really don't know. So going to school really helped actually help me to um, wanting to learn more because there's just a whole world out there that I don't know much about. And that's not just, you know, just books, but even experience. And that's the same thing as, you know, I was that lieutenant that I thought I knew everything. I was arrogant. I would talk a lot. Uh, but then, then again, as I, I experienced more, went to deployments and um, have more responsibilities, I realized that I, I don't know it all. And I would, I would also share that even as a battalion commander going in, I was very confident. I was very confident that uh, even though I've been away from um, the operation level for a while, it, just because I was a National Guard, um, uh, was it called? Uh, uh, officer at the uh, National Guard Bureau. So I didn't really get a chance to do a lot of the common, uh, the key assignments that an average officer or field grade officer would do. However, as far as the leadership, you know, I was, I was at, at that point where I was like, I got this, I know leadership, I know how to lead. But I will tell you that last two years was a very humbling experience for me. I think the pandemic has added um, a lot of challenges, uh, just, just going through that. Um, but Again, last few months, I've 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 been doing a lot of reflecting. It has humbled me. So I don't know if I answered your um, answer directly, but um, those are some of the key uh, events or experience in my life that helped to shape who I am today and my leadership style. Um, and then I think the leadership style, not to kind of go away from that subject, but leadership style. It is who you are. It's, it's it's your personality. I don't think you can really change your 
I, I guess in some ways a little bit, but just being stick to um, who you are as a person and just learn those uh, key leadership lessons. I think it will work. I think when you try to be something else or when you try to incorporate somebody else's style, it just doesn't work. So I kind of uh, realized that I need to stick to who I am, my own personality, things that I'm very strong at, and then continuously make improvements on the areas that I need to work on. Um, and then continuously read and learn. Um, I think that's kind of helped me a lot along the way. Thank you. Yes, it, it, it helped to um, answer the question. And, and, and I just wanted to say thank you for sharing that because I think a lot of us have this very similar story because um, my family is also first generation immigrants to the United mm -hmm. States. And uh, I was also enlisted and I went uh, the green to gold route to become an officer. And so I would agree in many ways that it is kind of a, almost like a summary of, of your lifelong journey, your experiences, both academic and institutional and the folks that you have the opportunity to interact with and learn from. And this is, you know, coming from being an enlisted soldier to you know, learning to be a junior NCO as a corporal, uh, to being a lieutenant, and now where I'm at now is a 05. So it is, um, it is an, a, a constant lifelong journey, and you don't really, I don't think you ever really master it, but you do continue to evolve and you continue to grow and develop and learn. Um, as you as you as you get older and you get wiser i guess but uh, but thank you for sharing that. That <laughs> thank you yeah. thank you hopefully we get wiser <laughs> anybody uh, else juan i know you're listening you got a you got a story to tell <laughs> hello folks hello sir um i i i, I, I guess sir if you're asking if i have a a, a leadership related story i um uh, i may not i i i didn't didn't serve in the military very long so um but uh but but i, I have i in in in, in uh incongruous with with uh, what dr show was saying i completely understand um i do have uh, uh experiences in the civilian sector um uh and um certainly um one of the things that uh that, that she mentioned that um that that kind of stood out to me was uh, her experience uh, concerning watching others not necessarily do what they're supposed to do. Uh, and then, you know, as you get into a higher position, you definitely want to stamp that out and, and be a better example. Um, you know, I certainly experienced that as a federal contractor, um, as a contractor watching federal employees doing things they weren't supposed to do um or what have you and then later on especially now being in a, in a position where i can actually influence or make uh, make some some modicum of an influence actually um you know it, it's it, it's certainly an opportunity to not do those things or to do things differently um but you do you do you do quickly realize that you don't know everything um as you uh move up in, in status um so I, I i completely concur and i really appreciate the uh the, this this seminar and hearing that from another, so another person's perspective yeah, leadership is such a perishable thing. You know, uh, it's never, there's no cookie cutter for it. Uh, and I'll tell you that the worst, in my opinion, the worst violators of their own leadership philosophies are generals and admirals who get relieved. You know, why did that happen? I mean, we have several of those, several, you know, uh, which is unbelievable. Uh, many years ago, General Odierno was in the chief of staff and we had a series of toxic leadership with generals in the army, just in the army. They're being believe or um, violating just the basic principles of leadership. Um, and so he, he called everybody to include uh, the secretary, the army secretary to do a meeting at West Point, I think it was 2015 where he addressed them in a, in a two-day two seminar, not seminar, but come to Jesus kind of a series of beratements and whatever have you that he did. Uh, 
mostly the, the attendees were those who were in command. Uh, the Secretary of the Army also attended because there were some civilians who were also violating just the basic rules of leadership, not necessarily just the laws and policies of violation. Some of them were criminal in that nature. Uh, and then the outcome was that I don't think it, it bubbled down to the future colonels and generals and whatever, because we still have incidents where people were getting relieved. Um, and the Navy is very famous for relieving their, uh, their, their officers in command. And all they say is, we lost confidence in your ability to command or to lead. And you're done, you know. Uh, but it hasn't stopped. Um, and, um, uh, you know, I didn't develop a leadership philosophy until I was a lieutenant, lieutenant colonel, battalion commander. I had notes and stuff like that I wanted to do. Uh, but my target audience was the lowest ranking individual in, in, the, in the battalion, the private or the spec four, and basically four, you know, that we're going to do everything we can to make the command successful, but we're going to do it safely uh, and we're going to do it positively. And I actually addressed that to them. And, I, and it was one pager, like, like Gina had said, one page, just one page, because people don't read the second page that's right <laughs> that's <laughs> too long true. right so yeah. uh, even general officers just got to have one page and it, and the target audience is not other generals the target audience is the field where they said that, that trust confidence and things of that nature is, is the stuff and that i uh i recently had a we under bell young hall we had a leadership seminar where we teach uh, leadership and progression were a core of engineers. These are GS 13s, 14s, and 15s. And uh, typically I would ask them in a pre seminar questionnaire describe your leadership a lot, describe your leadership style. You know, so what is that? Or are you an introvert, extrovert? Are you uh, an STJ? Or, you know, the, the Myers Briggs kind of, just to make it simple. And they're everywhere, you know. And, uh, and I said, well, the, what how, you know describe your leadership philosophy the 12 the 14 students that that I had held this seminar with and on and two weeks two weeks long seminar they didn't even have one they didn't even know what it is uh, simple stuff like that so we went through the series of doing that um, but you have a leadership philosophy you should have one um, if you want if you want to be a leader or manager and it's even more difficult for those in the civilian sector because they go through a series of training uh executive series of uh, of your qualification but none of them actually provides um, the issue of developing a leadership philosophy everything has to be technical right um but none of that is ever taught to them. I don't know why, but I guess it's too much, too much money to spend on. But uh, but if you could, if we could borrow your uh, your presentation uh, uh, separately from from the video, uh, your slides, I mean, and then just put that as a matter of reference uh, and post it in our in our website. I have I have it. Okay. Um, and uh, I will post it on our website separately right. from this video. But I do want to uh, also, as a civilian, want to make a comment about, uh, you know, I appreciate, I really love the presentation. And, and it struck me, one of the things that struck me was that it, your leadership philosophy is, is your own personality, really. And that is right. the truth. It's uh, you cannot teach that, but you can hone it uh, by making lists, I guess, and and then yeah. sticking to it, sticking mm -hmm. to that philosophy. Um, right. it, it, and and to me, it's more of a make sure that my my leadership philosophy is I I work with a lot of different people because I do have different clients and. Uh, but the one thing that I do um, make sure of is uh, I, ha I have to be kind, 
kindness is a big thing. <laughs> People don't, <laughs> you know, think about that. But really, the way that you um, speak and uh, deal with people excuse me i have a sore throat um <clears throat> is 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 through kindness and i think you get a lot more out of people by being kind than you know just saying you must do this that kind of thing so that's my i guess my yeah. one, my little contribution yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's well that's my leadership philosophy i guess so anyway yeah uh, thank you oh james I... james has uh, a question so go ahead james well it, it's really not more a question uh, um, but uh I, I, gina i do appreciate it so much uh your uh, your briefing in this seminar and taking the time um this saturday afternoon i think your your briefing was was great um i really want to i honed on to your your comment earlier about um your personality and who you are and whatnot, and, and it doesn't, you know, and you shape your leadership based on your, on your personality, um, mm -hmm. and the mere fact that, um, in, for for the most part, in the military they we, we they tend to look at type A personality, right? But it's difficult for some folks that are, you know, um, um, introverts and all that stuff and their personality is more on the sidelines and whatnot but you have to be able to connect to those individual um, service members whether they're your seniors your peers and your and, and support leaders so in that case for me you know it was a little difficult especially in the beginning um, I know my old battalion commander when I was a, a captain uh, Colonel Brian Tempest really pushed hard and said you need to be able to connect to your soldiers and all that stuff. You need to write your leadership philosophy and all that stuff, a one pager and all that stuff. And I was, we were deployed at this time. We were in Iraq and all that stuff. And, and it, it forced me to really think how I'm going to connect with my soldiers. But it, then again, I don't have that type A personality. So I did what I do best is really to connect with them by just talking to them in an individual basis. Uh, or in a group, in a more informal type of um, um, relationship, you know, I I went out with them, convoys, you know, you know the log, you know, log packs and whatnot, um, you know, talk to them when they get up in the morning and, and whatnot, even at night. Um, so it was, in, in, to my point, is that you as a person and trying to hone those skills and trying to connect to those individuals would be successful and. Uh, based on your experience and how you want to shape it and not change your whole personality and be a different person um, and whatnot. So I, I really do appreciate it. It seems that, you know, how I tried to uh, be a better leader is somewhat similar to what you have done when go, going through the ranks and in successful battalion command and um, so on and so forth. But, so then again, I, I really do appreciate it. Thank you so much. And uh, I think Juan has a question also. Oh, I, 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 I also wanted to piggyback off of what the general said and what, what James said. Um, I, I think, um, and, and my, my experience is a little different. I, most of my career has been as a civilian federal contractor, um, but, but I, I will say, and, and, and definitely in congruence with what the general said and some of the things that Dr. Cho brought up during her presentation that, um, yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, the private sector doesn't spend any money really on, on leadership training in quotations. It's, it's, it's uh, uh, management is far more profitable to them than leadership. Um, so you, you, get, you get these these PowerPoint presentations that you have to watch on your own and they talk about why you shouldn't, how you shouldn't yell at people in the office or you should be careful what you say around certain people and they, they make you, and you, you gotta watch them and you can just click through them to the end and take a little quiz at the end. And there's like, there's like dozens of those that you have to take every month. And I've been doing this for 10 years. And it's never changed. Um, most of the things that, that have shaped my leadership philosophy are the things that I learned in my time as an officer in the Marine Corps. That's basically been the basis for my, my, the way that I deal with other people at work is that. Um, that that was the beginning of my adult professional career. It's something that I aspired to be since I was a child. And you know, I, I in between in between my ears, I'm still a Marine Corps officer. That, that, you know, some people might not think that I am, but 
you know, in, in my head, I think I am. Um, and, and so, uh, but, but I do work in technology. Um, I do work in IT and I work in the world of introverts and I am not an introvert. I am, I, 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 uh, one of the few things that I have picked up from my time, from some of the training and things like that, that they offer you in civilian management and partly in the military is Myers-Briggs and type uh, personalities and what have you. And I am an ENTJ and I've, I've done this exercise with all the teams that I've been in charge of because although, although I'm a federal contractor and I have no control or authority over, over what the federal staff wants to do and what they do, um, I do have control over my teams as a, as, a, as, a, as a project manager, as a senior project manager. And what I've done in the past, and I still do this every now and then, is I encourage my team members to take the Myers-Briggs assessment. And they tell me what, they're, what they get, the results. And I keep a list in my drawer. And every time I have to talk to one of them, I pull that little list out and I look at them like, oh, okay, this person's like, okay. So I already know how to talk to them and what they're, uh, what they're expecting or how, how to best communicate with them. It's just, just uh, some random thing that I do. Um, but it certainly helped me out a lot. Um, it helped me out a lot to understand how I think and how I receive information and how I communicate versus how others and in my field are most likely to think most of them are introverts. Most of them do not like talking to people. Developers tend to be that way. Um, and so, you know, I know not to, not to come at them too aggressively or to uh, exactly how to motivate them. I've learned that over time. So that's, um, I, I appreciate you, you bringing things like that up during this, uh, this conversation because you don't really hear it as a civilian. Um, my company isn't going to have seminars like this. They don't care about those things. So. <laughs> So we will uh, we will certainly uh, uh, record. Well, we're recording it now, but we're also uh, put as a resource. The iGen uh, leadership seminar is on September 9th, and we you know we'll gain your uh, permission, Gina, to show it to them. Uh, I think it's very important, and also <laughs> use clips and whatever have you, uh, especially your uh, your presentation. Uh, as a matter of resource for others to to learn from, uh, it's very yes, useful. So, uh, so you get a you get a a plus 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 plus. I don't know, <laughs> two thousand times. <laughs> uh, James has a question. James has a question. Go ahead, James. Aloha <laughs> from Ililani. Oh, yeah. uh, this is General James Hirai, and I know oh, he, he, always, oh, he, always he just said James. In. Sorry, he always sneaks in. <laughs> yeah. Hello, Jim. Hey, I, I heard you guys talking about the the hot weather here uh, on on your end. Yeah, it's terrible here. I think it might get up into the eighty <laughs> today. We got uh, twenty to thirty mile an hour trade winds. It's kind of cool. Tony knows Central Oahu really well. <laughs> In the valley, yes. Yeah. Hey, Tony and uh, the PPOM team, thanks for uh, you know setting up another one of these terrific seminars, and um, uh, for uh, Gina, as as Tony said, and you heard the reaction from all the folks participating. You know, very good uh, ideas and stimulation of their our own ideas and, and thoughts. And uh, I I would just Tony, if it's okay, just offer offer a few. A few things that that I think um, uh, you, you know we might want to consider as well. Uh, you know, on the values and beliefs, um, and and especially because of this is a, a PPOM crowd, and as was mentioned by uh, I think it was um, uh, James and uh, others. Uh, you know, we have to be cognizant of biases, biases. You know, our mm -hmm. own. Uh, we all have them. Uh, some of them are helpful and good and uh, charitable, and some of them aren't. Um, and uh, we live in a world of, of biases. And, you know, you only have to look at the paper almost at least once a week, if not more often, where people are expressing their biases in, in the most violent ways. And that's not necessarily... The, the bubble that most of us work in. Uh, however, all these bubbles overlap and uh, we will be dealing with all kinds of people. And so, it, it, you know, on, on, our, on our own biases, these are very, very difficult sometimes to recognize. 
uh, because all of us have a our own protective shield of denial. <laughs> you know, uh, everybody on the road on on uh, I ninety five are terrible drivers, except me. I I pay close attention, but everybody else is a <laughs> terrible driver. You know, inconsiderate, um, not paying attention, but not me. I'm I'm uh, I'm a professional driver, so we we know that. And so we have to take that into account. And so for uh, developing, um, and especially if you're writing your philosophy, it's really good early on to bounce those off of people you know and know you very, very well. And you know to ask them, consult with them and say, hey, is this me? Or is this me in my most wishful thinking? Or is this me aspirational? And, and, you know, on the aspirational part, I, I don't think that that's should should um, you shouldn't include it because it is aspirational. Um, because, as Gina said, you know, this is a guide that hopefully you'll go back to and uh, and kind of grade yourself. Uh, one of the, the biases that I thought might come up in this conversation is. Uh, you know, based upon all of our backgrounds, and uh, many of us have uh, not just some religious background, but some of us have very significant religious backgrounds, and uh, we identify very, very closely with those backgrounds. Um, the thing is, is that in our uh, general business, and I recognize not everybody here is military, but in our in our general business, and I think in businesses, you know, overall, um, you know, what we bring from those religious backgrounds and, and what we are more subtle uh, about is something to consider. And um, the question is, well, how do you feel when somebody is right up front, almost um, in some cases in your face about religious beliefs um, and what might that be in terms of a chilling effect among those who have different backgrounds, different beliefs. And, and so it's just something to consider. I, I, I'm not saying you, you should leave those at the door, um, but that's, if that's who you are, just be cognizant of how you present that it to, to others so that you can uh, accommodate the variety of beliefs that they make our country great. Um, it, the, the last commentary uh, from our former Marine about leading and management is, is a really good point. And, um, you know, those are, it, it's not a, a distinction. Is it, is it leadership? Is it management? You know, it's really a Venn diagram. We operate all over the place, but um, you know, on, on leadership, folks tend to say leadership, focus on what's right, management on what's efficient, profitable. Uh, but there are elements of both that, that overlap. It's not an either or kind of a thing. And then on, um, you know, the really uh, important concept is uh, assessing as you go. And Gina, I know you did some very deep reflection uh, upon completion of command, uh, but I also know you, you know you were getting feedback along the way, and you know, kind of checking yourself. Um, there's that kind of day to day uh, feedback, and one of the things about feedback is just be cognizant of the dipstick that you're using, because you know it, and and this kind of goes back to the bias thing. Every system that you could use as a dipstick has its own bias. And um, if you're a fan of uh, Daniel Kahneman, the, um, the Nobel Prize winner in economics, um, psychologist, uh, the issue of noise in a system, which is different than bias. But you know, every system is gonna have some, um, some quirks in it that may not give you a good read about what you're really looking for. And so the caution is uh, make sure that the, the dipsticks that you're using are appropriate for you uh, and not something that is manufactured for something that may be related to you, but not, not exactly you. 
Um, one of the dipsticks uh, most of us are familiar with is, you know, how you get graded is whether you get selected for command, selected for promotion. Uh, and uh, those systems have been refined over the years. And Tony was talking about, you know, uh, command, command selections too. And there's a new system in the army, which is quite um, rigorous, uh, yet to be seen, you know, how, how it really pans out. But um, uh, that's another uh, form of a dipstick. And, um, you know, the, the caution is not tying your own self-worth to somebody else's dipstick, you know, that, that may not be appropriate for you uh, all the time. Um, and, and I, you know, I, I, I take the comment, I think it was um, uh, the last comment, Vita, on, uh, you know, being kind. And one of the people you should be kind to is yourself. So, because um, some of the measurements we get, you know, we should be very hard on ourselves, uh, especially when you're in a leadership position, a command, especially. Uh, there's no question people are depending on you. So you should be, uh, as they say, in the old days, all you can be. Uh, on the other hand, um, you know, you're human too. And uh, self-care, uh, Gina, that, that you had, as you said, in your self-assessment, you know, applies to yourself as well. So that's, a, uh, I think, a very important thing to consider. And, um, you know, you, you, you closed your presentation with the learning uh, comment, Gina. And I think, uh, as was said by many of the folks, that's uh, uh, very, very important. In fact, you know, Tony was talking about his story about running into uh, former leaders and uh, trying to assess and say, okay, what, what was working there? Or what wasn't working here? One of the things I, I discovered in, in the kinds of people that I wanted to associate with or not was, was not their style, not if they were introverts, extroverts. Uh, it wasn't any of that. It's not where they went to school, what their degrees were. It wasn't any of that. It was um, who were the learners? You know, who are the active learners? Those were the people that I felt most uh, comfortable with. And then who are the people that I wanted to stay away from? And those were the people, uh, you didn't have to spend much time with them. And it was evident that they had stopped learning a long time ago. <laughs> and uh, they really weren't interested in learning anything and felt that they had um, kind of learned it all. Um, and so, uh, you know, those are, uh, it's just some of the comments. It's very stimulating discussion. Uh, Gina teed it up, but everybody contributed. And I uh, appreciate the opportunity again, Tony, to, to sit in on these and uh, to continue to sure. learn. Yeah. I, I think uh, I got all your notes there, Jim. And I think they're very important notes that, you know, we learn every day. We learn from others. Uh, we don't stop learning. You know, those who stop learning are the ones that become toxic and they get really frustrated because uh, nobody wants to wants to be led by them uh, and then it becomes really controversial but uh, I think I know there's a lot of things that, that we can consider about this it's a great presentation by Dr. Gina Cho uh, I met her when first time was a captain in some coffee shop down in Roslyn I think it was uh, actually at the metro stop <laughs> way back when she probably remembers that trying to deal with what she should do uh, to expand her career in the, in the army not just in the national guard but in the army in totality and i wouldn't be so surprised once she gets done with with uh, harvard that she'll be going into a joint job somewhere before she gets to command a brigade uh, and that's the you know this we're very high on her and uh, one of our rising stars but we're going to use uh, your presentation, Gina, in, in future uh, seminars, not just, well, we videotaped this, we recorded because we want it to be a resource for other develop, uh, leadership and professional development over time. And I think uh, we should continue this. The next series, I think, we have one on gender discrimination, I think it is. Yes. The next one, and then sexual, sexual harassment which is very evident here on the things that we're seeing today. Uh, very extreme behavior, very extreme uh, thinking. So uh, 
so again, you guys have a good weekend. Thanks, James, for uh, Jim, for uh, joining us all the way from Hawaii. Had to wake up early in the morning, I'm sure. Uh, on the cool weather in Hawaii, damn you guys in Hawaii. Uh, but, but we'll just shrivel up here and burn away uh, in the hot weather. Uh, okay, sounds good. I think we've uh, culminated now. And again, thank you very much for attending. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Jim, I'll get back with you uh, on that uh, lady that works with you about her father who served in the, in the service. We're to, I'll get back to you. I have information. Okay, sounds good. Y'all have a good weekend. All right. Bye. 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 Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.